It's my pleasure to open up the afternoon session. And our first speaker is Dr. Carl Meyer. And she's going to talk to you on how we reveal secrets of the heart by stress testing and imaging. Today, a lot of the diagnoses we do in cardiology are done through the use of imaging techniques. And Carla is going to share that with you, particularly as it relates to women. Thank you, Dr. Q. So, Dr. Galati touched on this earlier this morning, but as a clinical cardiologist who sees over 500 women a year with ischemic heart disease, honestly, I think the big problem is that women just have atypical symptoms. I know she told, showed you a slide of a third, but it's very uncommon for me to have women come to me and tell me, I'm having that crushing substernal chest pain and I'm all sweaty and I'm short of breath. I hear that maybe less than 1% of the time. So most of the time, like I said, women do not present that way. So they usually present with, I do have chest pain, but it's kind of it's kind of substernal or it's kind of my back or it's kind of my stomach and my left arm hurts and I'm short of breath and I'm tired and I don't really know what's wrong with me. So, I mean, that's it. And then, the, and then usually they mention anxiety. So I think that's what's really difficult for both the women patients presenting to the cardiologist and the cardiologist themselves is to try and figure out what that constellation of symptoms really is. And that's where stress testing comes into play. Before we get there, though, I just want to share this study with you. This is a study that came out way earlier than the one that Dr. Galati showed you in younger women. This one is in older women. The mean age was 66. And basically, they were from 550 women from five different hospitals. And they just sent them, they just asked them, did you have, before you came to the hospital, did you have any symptoms whatsoever that made you think that you were having a heart attack or you had heart disease? And you can see in the, by the boxes over there, the most common symptom was unusual fatigue. Well, that can be due to any illness. You can see that's almost, you know, 70% there, followed by a sleep disturbance, which again, you can't sleep if you're sick from anything. So that's not too helpful. You can see shortness of breath then was the next most common symptom in about 40%. And in this study, only about 25% actually mentioned that they were having chest pain before. So I think, like I said, and even in the study that Dr. Glady mentioned in younger people, they had chest pain, but I think it's atypical. And I think that the most important thing then is just for the cardiologist to listen to those symptoms and if, the, if that patient has a lot of risk factors, because we heard about risk factors this morning, we heard about high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, family history, smoking, all of those things. If you have some of those risk factors, then the burden of proof is, is upon that cardiologist to do further testing to try and figure out if these symptoms that you're having could be due to heart disease, because you're at, you're at intermediate to high risk of having heart disease just by having those risk factors. So I'm going to skip over this one because Dr. Gladi presented this this morning. Um, and basically, the very first stress test that most people are going to get referred to for is an exercise ECG. And why is that? Well, it's because it's easy to do. It doesn't cost very much. It's widely accepted. And you know, there's a lot of women who have been enrolled in those studies. There were over 29 of them. And you can see there were over 3,000 women enrolled in those studies. So it shows up in our guidelines because we heard that term this morning about how we need to do this as first-line therapy for all intermediate, you know, inter women at intermediate risk who are presenting with some sort of symptoms, who can exercise, and, and that screening ECG that you always get at your cardiologist that has to be normal. Now, what this test has shown is that it has a similar ability, if it's normal, to exclude um, heart diseases causing the symptoms in women and men, and you can see the numbers there. And it also provides very important information that has been shown to predict death in large populations, like your exercise capacity, your heart rate recovery, which is whether or not your heart rate drops by 12 beats within a minute, your heart rate response, which is your chromotropic response, and whether or not that was normal. And then all of that gets combined into this Duke treadmill score, which has also been shown to predict death in large populations. So this is just looking, it's a study that looked at this meta-analysis of, of, of exercise capacity. So how much exercise can you do on that treadmill uh, ECG stress test that you're getting? And what you can see is they've got asymptomatic and symptomatic women. And you can see that when, if you can't do five METs, and that five METs is uh, just barely going into that second stage of that treadmill where it increases in speed and elevation, then there's a markedly increased risk 
for death if you can't perform that level of exercise, regardless of whether or not you have symptoms or not. And you can see it's very similar to people who can't exercise at all, because they're in that very far bar where it says pharmacologic stress. But there are problems with an exercise CCG, and these are the problems. If it's positive, it doesn't predict coronary artery disease as a cause of symptoms in women compared to men. So that specificity or positive predictive value is very, very low. And I'll tell you, 50% of the time, it's going to be positive in women, so it's a coin flip. If it's positive, you know, most of those are false positives. And why is it less accurate in women? First of all, there's a lower prevalence of coronary artery disease in women that can exercise. Not in women who can't, but in women who can, there's just a lower prevalence. And also that, that ST segment criteria that we're gonna look at in a little bit, in women it's been shown to vary if you have mitral valve prolapse, if you have that coronary vasospasm or microvascular disease called syndrome X. Um, and also it's been shown to vary even with estrogen replacement therapy and with your endogenous estrogens throughout the menstrual cycle. So it's this positive, this, these false positive results that ultimately result in even further testing and cause a lot of anxiety for a lot of women. So this is an example. This is a 53-year-old woman. She has exertional dyspnea, and she had, she's had mid-substernal chest discomfort for 24 months. She's got some risk factors, including a positive family history of coronary artery disease, smoking, hypertension, elevated cholesterol, and triglycerides, and she's postmenopausal. I'll tell you, her EKG is absolutely normal, and the segment that we're gonna look at is right here, the little area right past the spikes. That's the ST segment that we're looking for to try and determine if it's a positive or a negative test. So she exercised for nine minutes and eight seconds. She didn't have any chest pain. She just stopped because she was tired. And basically what we see in her response is see how it's sagging down now? It was nice and level before, and now it's sagging down. So this, these are ST depressions, which are just classic for a positive treadmill stress ECG. So now she's in that 50% of women who test positive. So now, you know, She's anxious, she's worried she might have heart disease. We're gonna to have to do another test, so she's gonna to have to come back to prove that she still doesn't have heart disease. So now she's coming back for a second test, and this happens frequently, that's why I'm sharing it for you. So this is the second test that she comes back for. So she has to get back on the treadmill, she has to do that all over again, and this time we're combining it with echocardiography. So we take images here at rest, and this is the heart in different views so that we can see all of the muscle, all of the heart muscle. And then we take, as soon as she gets off the treadmill, we take pictures again, and this is immediately post-stress. And what you can see is that if it's a normal test, the heart muscle should start thickening, and the heart should start beating faster, and that cavity should start getting smaller. And you can see in this particular views, it definitely is. And then these are the last views that we get with the treadmill stress echo. And again, you can see that in these immediate post-exercise views that the heart is getting much smaller and there's much more thickening of that wall motion. So, so again, this, this would be, this is an absolutely normal treadmill stress echo uh, and frequently we have to follow all of those positive treadmill ECGs with some sort of imaging stress test. Now let's talk about stress echo, being you saw, just saw some images. This is also a very useful test in women because it's convenient, it's readily available, it's fairly inexpensive. It provides us structural and functional data. What, what I mean by that is we can look and see whether or not there's blockages just by looking to see if the heart's thickening more, but we can also see if there's other causes for the chest pain, such as mitral valve prolapse or perhaps fluid around the heart. So it allows us to look at all of these different things, perhaps elevated pressure in the lungs. So we can look at different things that could be causing the chest pain. It's very safe in women of childbearing potential. There's a large database including both exercise and women who can't exercise. We use a, pharma, a, a drug therapy to simulate exercise. Um, and it's been proven to be more accurate than just plain exercise ECG. And it has comparable accuracy in women and men and, and provides important information that has been shown to predict death in large populations. So we'll look at this. This is looking at the comparison of exercise ECG to exercise echo. And you can see the ECG is shown, that the sensitivity and specificity and the accuracy is shown by the, the green bars. And if we just add those echo images onto that treadmill ECG information, you can see that it significantly increases the ability of that test to determine whether or not you have uh, heart disease. 
This is looking at dobutamine stress echo in this particular study and comparing it in women versus men. The women are shown by the pink bars and the men in the green. And again, there was really no significant difference in the accuracy of this test when you compare it between the two sexes. When we look at the event-free survival, so what this is is event-free survival means um, no heart attacks, no need for you know, PC, uh, stenting or bypass surgeries or deaths. So it's looking at all of that combined. And what you can see is if the exercise ECG portion and the exercise echo are negative, there are essentially no events. If the exercise echo is negative, the ECG is a little bit positive, there's a little bit few more events, but not a significant amount. If both the exercise, if the echo is positive, regardless of what the exercise ECG shows, you can, you can see that there's significantly more events that occur, just showing you how powerful of a diagnostic test it is. Now this is looking similarly, it's showing you the same thing. This is just looking at dobumine instead of, which is the drug that we use to simulate exercise in people who can exercise. And again, it's showing you if the test is negative, there are essentially no events over this three year time period. However, if it's positive, we have a significant uh, amount of events that occur. So now there are limitations with stress echo and these are that Sometimes people just have lousy images. That happens in about 10% of patients. It could be because they have lung issues. It could be because they have large breasts. But it, sometimes it's just very difficult to really get good images. Um, and also, the, the, the results of the test are really dependent upon the sonographer to get really good images and also dependent on the cardiologist who's interpreting those images and how much training they've had in high, and whether or not it was a high or low volume lab. So this is just an example. So this is, this is an image that we frequently see in the stress lab, and you can see that you can't even see much of anything, so it would be very difficult for us to interpret. However, when you give contrast, you can see uh, that muscle, and you can see it thickening um, with exercise. So this is an example of a dobutamine stress echo with contrast in a 50 or 4-year-old woman. She had new onset chest pain. She had a bunch of cardiac risk factors. Um, and you can see here that this is dobutamine. So at baseline, you see this is all thickening really, really nice. You can see not as well up here in this segment. Uh, and then as we increase the dose of dobutamine, the heart starts beating harder and faster and thickens more. But you can see as we go on, when we get up to here, this whole section of the heart, the apex, is not thickening. So that really is a positive stress test result. It's telling us that, yes, this is probably a lesion in the main left anterior descending corner artery and that she needs to be referred for uh, invasive angiography. And that's exactly what she received. And what you can see here is that she's got, this is the left anterior descending corner artery. She's got a very, very tight blockage. And then you see some dye hang up here and a spontaneous dissection. So this is, it definitely um, correlates with her stress echo results. Now, there's another stress test that we have called the myocardial perfusion spect imaging. And that's also like uh, echocardiography can be combined with either exercise or a pharmacologic <laughs> drug, either adenosine, dipyridamine, or regadenosine. And what we found that over the years is this was a very tricky test in women because we started off with these very low energy radio tracers to look at perfusion. These radio tracers go up with the blood flow in the heart and then are taken up by the muscle. And these lower energy radio tracers were scattered by the breast tissue, and therefore we saw a lot of uh, defects that looked like it was due to not the heart not getting enough of the tracer, but it was just really due to attenuation or, or artifacts from the breast. And they, multiple things were tried, like changing, putting on breast markers, changing breast position, but it really didn't help until we developed higher um, energy tracers that had less scattering by that breast tissue. And then we started using SPECT to look at wall motion because we could do that with these higher energy tracers. And once you can look at wall motion along as, with looking at perfusion or blood flow to the muscle, those two things are very powerful in trying to determine if something really is not getting enough blood or whether or not it's just an artifact from breast tissue. And this is basically showing just that. This is the radio tracer that was really scattered by breast tissue and it's just telling you that it had a really hard time diagnosing correctly whether or not um, a coronary lesion existed. When we switched to the higher energy tracers, it got better. When we started looking at wall motion and function, it got even better in being accurate and saying whether or not there was a blockage there. 
So this is what this looks like. So these are, so this is the radio tracer that's taken up and on the top part we have the stress images and then we line it up. In this particular case, it's lined up with a, uh, it, it, a software, basically a software analysis went in there and it smoothed it out for any sort of breast attenuation uh, defects that may be present. And because there was a, in this particular patient, we can see that, the, that there's a, it's dark here, here, here. So it's suggesting that maybe there, that part of the heart, there's a blockage and it's not getting enough perfusion and therefore not taking up that radio tracer as much as the other areas. However, when we added the, the, the software to take out the common breast attenuation artifacts that we see in our patient population, it went away. And again, you can see that here in the stress images, we see that and it went away. So the only way to really know for sure though is you, got, you have to do stress images, uh, rest images to compare them with the stress images. And again, we had the same problem where we saw the artifact on the stress images, but on the rest, there was absolutely no artifact at all. So, th so this is one of those tests where we're kind of stuck in trying to figure out, okay, is this an artifact or is this a true blockage that's preventing that tracer from getting through and being taken up by the heart muscle? So we go back to the raw data, and that's exactly what this is, and it's showing us that when the patient was stressed, the arm was, um, much, much lower, so the heart's lower and the breast is just shadowing this much on top. So this is showing like a artifact, like we saw, like it's not getting enough tracer when really it's just the breast tissue hanging over. And when the patient came back for rest, it was the arm was up higher and the breast tissue was uniformly over top of the heart. So there wasn't one area that wasn't being shadowed, if that makes any, any sense. So um, for um, myocardial perfusion spectra imaging in women, we have similar diagnostic and prognostic uh, ability as stress echo. There's also a large clinical database for both exercise and, and the drug, uh, sesame B spec diag and diagnostic and prognostic use in women supporting that. And that's exactly what's shown on this slide. So we can see that women are over here, if they have a normal uh, technetium 99M spec study, there's very few events, less than 1% per year. If it's an abnormal, there's a significantly more events. In this particular study, there were even more events in men with an abnormal study than there were in, in the women. There are problems, though, with, with stress myocardial perfusion spectra imaging. One of those is it's expensive because it takes a radioactive tracer. It also, um, of all the stress testing methods, it has the highest radiation exposure, um, so it's not a test that you want to get every year. Um, and therefore, it's been recommended in the guidelines to avoid use of premenopausal women and women at low risk for coronary disease. And also, it's been recommended to follow techniques to limit that radiation exposure. So what that would be is just doing one injection of the tracer, which would be at, at you know, for the stress images and not for the rest images. And if the stress images were absolutely normal, then, then just foregoing that second dose of radioactive tracer. And again, a, a stress nuclear test only provides perfusion, so it tells you whether or not there's a blockage there or not, and function data. It doesn't tell you whether or not there's mitral valve prolapse, doesn't tell you whether or not there's any fluid around the heart, it doesn't tell you anything else. It just gives you that perfusion and LV function data, that left heart function data. So another test that we can do after one of those uh, positive treadmill ECGs is we can do a coronary computed tomography and geography, uh, and, and, and these are the pros listed here. There's a very large clinical database. The CONFIRM registry has over 12,128 women in it, and it's been shown to be very helpful in diagnosing coronary disease and predicting events, which we'll look at in a little bit. There was no significant difference in its ability to diagnose coronary disease in women and men, and it has much better spatial resolution, which means you can see everything in the chest and outside the heart much better. Uh, than MRI, it's more widely available, shorter exams, um, and it also allows determination of plaque composition, and that's important because if we know what type of plaque it is, that also predicts future events. So this is looking at um, the prognosis. So again, we're looking at uh, survival um, and, and in men versus women, and the women are on the top, and there were over 2,000 women in the study, and the men over 3,500. And what you can see here is that the curves look very similar. So the event rates were very similar between the two sexes. So it wasn't gender that made the difference. What made the difference was 
the number of blockages that we actually saw on the images. So if you were normal, the event rate was pretty low. If you had non-obstructive disease, you had, you know, there was more, there was increased, uh, decreased uh, survival. Uh, if you had one vessel disease, two vessel disease, and three vessel disease, or left main, which is a three vessel equivalent, you can see that your survival progressively decreased. So it was more about the burden of disease than it was about gender. So this is, this is an image of a, a woman who came in who was having chest pain, and she had a positive nuclear stress test. So this was further evaluation following that. And these are the non-contrast enhanced images. And what you can see is that these are all calcified plaques in the coronary arteries. And this, this is not contrast. She hasn't been given contrast yet. So you can see she's got calcium in the calcified plaques in the LAD and the RCA and the CERC. That total calcium score is 1362. Anything above 400 predicts risk of future events. And we heard that in this morning's talk. So this person already is at high risk for future events just based on that calcium score. Now when we look at the plaque composition and stenosis severity, this is after the dye was given. Basically what you see here is this is the LAD, and you can see that there is, um, this is the calcified plaque that we saw earlier, and this is the non-calcified plaque. So this is that fatty, fatty substance that's in, the, in that plaque. And it's actually this fatty substance, not the calcification, but the fatty substance that has been shown to be more predictive of more heart attacks and, 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 and future events than it is those stable calcified plaques. And then basically over here, they're just showing you how they look so different. This is how it looks from angiography. This is in the cath lab invasive versus in the CT suites. In the CT suite allows you to pick up all those different plaque characteristics, whereas in the, in the invasive angi angiography, all you get is what, you know, how tight that blockage really is. And again, this was the last part of their coronary artery showing you that all three had significant stenosis and calcification with both calcified and non-calcified plaque. So this is a, a patient who definitely needs Dr. Barker's services, who you'll hear in just a little bit. So the cons for computed uh, CT angiography is that, again, there's radiation exposure. Uh, dose reduction techniques can be followed uh, and should be. Um, there's limited ability to diagnose significant steno stenosis when you have severe calcification and stents because you just can't see past that calcium when it's solid calcification. So it's not it's going to have a very low predictive value in predicting whether or not that really is a tight blockage because it's really hard to see. And again, there's iodinated contrast concerns, so you have to avoid it in patients with advanced kidney disease. And the very last imaging modality that we have to try and determine if, 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 if your chest pain is due to heart disease, is cardiac magnet, magnetic resonance imaging. And the pros for this one are that it provides better temporal resolution. There's no radiation concern. It can give you both that functional and structural data. So it can t show you mitral valve prolapse. It can show you valve leakage. It can show you fluid around the heart. It can show you everything that echocardiography can. Um, and it can detect both microvascular, that small vessel disease, and large vessel disease. It's the only test that can because it's not hindered by artifacts. It just gives you really good, clean pictures. Um, it get, you have very good images even in obese patients. There's no significant difference in its ability to diagnose coronary artery disease in women and men. Um, and it's better at excluding coronary artery disease than stress and myocardial perfusion imaging, again, because you don't have those at breast attenuation artifacts, and it can be performed without contrast in patients with advanced kidney disease. We can look at the wall motion like we do in echo. And what's the, 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 the prognosis data is emerging with cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. We know that ischemia is very important in predicting how many events you're going to have in the future, as well as wall motion abnormalities, but also what that LV function is. If it's less than 40%, it increases, it increases your risk for future events, and as whether or not there's any evidence of any scar. Uh, in patients who receive gadolinium, we can tell whether or not there's any scar, and the amount of scar has been shown to predict uh, future events also. So this is just looking at look, the major um, annual events of major adverse cardiovascular events. Again, heart attacks, need for stents, uh, CAB, uh, and, and it's stratified by sex and ischemia. And basically, you can see the major adverse events are on this panel. Cardiac death is over here. And you can see that, again, it's not a, a gender issue here. 
The most important thing in determining whether or not you have events or death is just how much ischemia you had on that cardiac MRI Im image. So this is an example of a regadenosine CMR with first pass perfusion imaging. So regadenosine is a drug in a 42-year-old woman with chest pain. And what you're going to see is the hyperperfused areas. Let's see if we can get that to play again. So the hyperperfused areas are going to show up as real as dark. So you're going to see that the, right down here there's going to be a little dark band and through here, through here, and through here. So that's suggesting that there is a blockage in the right coronary artery in this particular patient. But we, this patient went on to get gadolidium, which is the dye that picks up whether or not there's been a scar. A scar is usually, it means prior heart attack. Um, and you can see that there also is, uh, it turns up white when you get gadolidium. And where these asterisks are is very white, so it's suggesting that there's a significant amount of scar there too. And so this patient, she underwent invasive coronary angiography to try and figure out um, where, whether or not this was a blockage that could be intervened on. And you can see that there's a very significant um, high-grade stenosis right here in her uh, right coronary artery, very distal in the posterior descending coronary artery. Now, there are some cons with MRI. Not all centers have stress MRI, so there's limited availability. The exam times are long. If you're claustrophobic, it's not the test for you. And, and it can only be combined with drugs. You can't combine it with treadmill exercise. So you, you lose all of that functional data that you get from just exercising on the treadmill. And the gadolidium cannot be used in patients with advanced kidney disease, so you lose that prognostic ability of that scar imaging that we just saw. So basically, this is kind of confusing, but I'd like to wrap it up with this very last slide. So this is, for the individual patient, this is what it's going to look like. So if, you have, if you're at intermediate risk, so if you have greater than two cardiac risk factors and you're presenting with chest pain or shortness of breath, for the majority of women, the resting ECG is going to be normal. So you're going to end up here. And you're going to end up having to undergo that exercise treadmill ECG. 50, over 50% 50 of the time is going to be positive, <laughs> and it's likely a false positive. And then what happens is then you end up over here with stress cardiac imaging, and that could be with echo, that could be with nuclear, that could with, be with CT angiogram or with MRI, because um, both all of them perform fairly well in women. And then once, based on that, once you have that imaging, then usually it's pretty obvious whether or not you have heart disease and whether or not you need to be referred on uh, to uh, interventional cardiologists for in, uh, cardiac catheterization and stenting.